my father had a substance abuse problem and I, um, he got saved and, and um, certainly the, the first few, four or five years of his salvation were pretty rough and pretty rough on mm. our family and um, especially your mum, I think. Um, yeah. Hmm. So, so he becomes a Christian and things get worse for your family? Uh, with a substance abuse problem, he had to come out of that lifestyle. Okay. And for some people it's quick, for some people it's not. He had a lot of anger issues, he had to give up an addiction. Hmm. Um, yeah, wow. Yeah. So, okay, so you grow up in a home where, okay, yeah, dad, dad's got, got his demons. What, how does that impact you as a child and, and how did that play out in your life? Yeah, like I said, I don't remember a great deal from from my early childhood. Um, like I said, there was there was certainly physical abuse there, because um, you know Dad was obviously very angry. But a lot of my memories start sort of, you know, more around the time that we are start going to church, and mm-hmm. Dad is starting to change, and um, mm. certainly becomes more involved in church. And you know, God works a miracle in that man's life. He's mm. yeah, he's he's a good man now. Yeah. Well. Wow. So you were able to see at a young age just the difference that God can make yeah, in someone's life. Yeah, a life. huge difference, yep. 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 yeah. Absolutely. Mm. So, so tell us, you're, you're getting older. Um, t- tell us about school life and just some of the decisions that you made there. Um, I went to a Christian school, so I was pretty much immersed in the Word of God from the time I was a little boy. Mm-hmm. So, um, and that certainly carried with me throughout my life. And um, I certainly had a great fascination with the book of Revelation, even as a, as a young child. Obviously... Uh, actually, in um, Pentecostal churches, no one, no one really delves into Revelation at all. No one really has a grasp or understands it. So a lot of it, I read that didn't mean anything to me. There was a lot of dragons and beasts, and I thought that was pretty cool. So I was pretty fascinated by all that. Sure. But God was able to use that later on in my life, actually, that, that fascination with that. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I went to a, a secular high school and certainly got exposed to a few different things there. And... Um, uh, I was pretty heavily involved in church in my early, early teenage life. Uh, it was certainly a good culture of small groups and youth groups that were pretty immersed mm-hmm. um, and pretty, pretty sheltered as well. Um, I started playing music in our church, you know, around the age of 13 or 14 and uh, really developed with that and, and enjoyed that. Um, yeah, and we started forming bands out of that, outreach bands and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so through your exposure to music and, and just the time that you had there in church in the band, that, that created some opportunities for you and your friends? Yeah, we, we started going in band competitions and then uh, we started to get uh, work in pubs and clubs. Um, and as that kind of started, we started getting exposed to, you know, drinking and, and other things like that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so that, that opened up a whole new realm for you almost. Uh, it created some opportunity for you there to experience some things that you'd never experienced before, maybe? Um, yeah, certainly that aspect of life. I'd never really grown up around pubs and clubs and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so we, you know, like I said, we're, we're exposed to um, things that we weren't really ready. I, I really don't believe that we should have been in those situations at that age. Hmm. Um, yeah, like in hindsight, it probably wasn't a very good idea to be playing in pubs and clubs at the age of 14, 15 or 16. Yeah. Um, yeah, although we, we presented, a, like we, we're doing this for outreach and so on, but being young and impressionable, that probably wasn't a very good idea. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So your mum's literally like dropping you off at the pub? or like? <laughs> no, we? no, we, um, yeah. we had a guy in our band that was in his 30s at the time. He would okay. um, certainly transport us around and do all those types of things. Yeah. But yeah, yep. So, so, and it was through that relationship that, that more avenues opened up and a whole new lifestyle. Yeah, um, yeah, look, that sort of lifestyle is a very slippery slope. Um, I think at the age of 16, uh, me and the bass player actually made a terrible decision. Um, the, the leader of the band, they were just much older than us, he started to use drugs. And um, we decided to tell him a lie and basically said that we've done it and basically bought some off him. We really had no concept of what we bought or um, the impacts of that. Um, so, yeah, we, we bought these drugs off, off this guy. And, um, yeah, when I say drugs, I don't mean things like tobacco or cannabis. I'm talking extremely addictive substances. Yeah, sure. Extremely addictive. And, um, yeah, we... We were down in Sydney actually for for a, a Christian conference, and um, we snuck out of that. And I stayed with my sister in the city, and we went into Sydney City, and 
we uh, very foolishly took everything that we had and that just altered the course of my life. Well, yeah, for the next 14 years. Yeah. Sure. So, so you're pretty young. You're not really prepared to be Absolutely making some not. of the decisions no, the, no. that you were making at the time. How did that impact you and, and what was the result of that? Um, we, we were instantly addicted. We, we didn't understand what addiction was. Hmm. We had no concept. We, we knew that drugs and things and that were bad, but, you know, you, you fool yourself and you're thinking you'll just do it once and you'll stop. Hmm. And the, what, what we took was insanely addictive. It was, we were just completely hooked pretty much straight away and our whole lives pretty much revolved around getting it again and doing it again, basically. Sure. And um, it certainly started us on a path of uh, recreational drug use. Mm, yeah. And, and so there was a period where it went from recreational use to, to something more serious. Do you want to describe that transition for us? Yeah. Um, my father had started to become a pastor through my teenage years. Mm. And in the midst of all of this and being highly involved in the church, um, he fell and... and um, basically separated from my mum and had a relationship with another woman. Um, mm. It's very raw. Mm. Sorry, I don't have to think about this stuff often. Sure. Mm. The pain I saw my mother go through is horrific. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't deal with the pain. So I, um, I just turned to drugs all the time. I just couldn't deal with it. It was mm. either that or kill myself. I didn't know what to do. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I think it's so interesting. Um, just the time that I've spent talking to you about this, Matt. Uh, so, so, so just for all of us, may, maybe a lot of us have never been exposed to, to drug use, especially at a young age and that sort of thing. But many of us are faced with circumstances that are out of our control. Can we all agree with that? We're faced with circumstances that are beyond us. We don't have the tools to be able to cope. We don't have what it takes to be able to navigate the, the challenges of life. And, and so through Matt's decisions, he'd already been setting himself up almost um, for, for using that to, to medicate, um, to self-medicate kind of the, the pain that you were feeling at that time. And, and I think that all of us can relate to that in some sense. Being forced into a situation that is out of your control and using what you have at the time to, to respond. Positive or negative, we, we respond with whatever we've got in our tool bag at the time. And for you, that happened to be drugs. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And, and so where, where did that lead you, Matt? Where, what did that do for you? You described before that that was a 14-year journey for you. Mm. Um, yeah, help, help us understand what that looks like. Yeah, look, initially I stayed in, in Moree for about a year and so did my mother. And um, towards the kind of the end of it, you know, about 12 months, I said to her, look, you know, her life was shattered as well. I said, look, I'm, I'm addicted to drugs. I need to get help. Like, mm. I need to go into rehab. I need to do something. And... So my mother organised for me to go to a rehab centre in Sydney. Um, we'd organised that. We, we, we moved down there and I did the induction and all these sorts of things. And look, in the midst of all of this, you know, I, I was still partying and doing things. And, and in Sydney, I, I had another friend there and we started going out. And in the midst of that, I, I, met, a, I met a woman. Um, and, yeah, basically decided not to go through with the rehab, which was very foolish. Mm. Um, I just told my mother I was going to get help, you know, some, some other way. I'll see a, you know, a drug counsellor, a psychologist. And, yeah, that I did. But um, certainly this relationship with the woman um, just led me further down the path of <laughs> absolute insanity in drug use. We were just taking copious amounts of substances. That it, it's, it's amazing we're even alive. Mm. Um, yeah, you fool yourself into thinking it's recreational just because you do it on a weekend, but the quantities that you, we were taking was just insanity. Mm. Um, yeah. Tell me, Matt, what was the impact that that had, especially on your mother, thinking that, hey, my son's finally starting to take some positive steps forward? Um, actually, midway through, actually probably a month or so after I, I um, stopped, I decided not to go to rehab. 
my mother decided to get back with my father. So she, she left me in Sydney um, and just kind of looked after herself and went back and, and pursued the, you know, reconciling with, with my father. I was pretty, pretty bitter about the fact that she was going back to him. I was pretty angry. Um, but yeah, I was in Sydney as a 19-year-old with a, with a really bad substance abuse problem. Mm. And I was there on my own, yeah. And um, yeah, it was pretty full on. Yeah. yeah. So, so you're literally spending, you, you were holding down a job at the time and just I've spending always, whatever you had. Look, I've always managed to hold down a job because I knew well, that was how you got money, basically. Sure. And the, the crazy that's thing smart. is... That's smart. Yeah, that's actually good. You're ahead of the curve is, on that one. You're not the only yeah. person there doing it. Mm. You, you always find a partner in crime. This is how it is. Like, sure. If you want it, it's there. There's other people doing it as well. Mm. Um, yeah, by the age of 21, I, I moved into King's Cross, uh, which is in Sydney, which is just absolute. Another great decision that was. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I made a lot of good decisions. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, broken relationships was the main reason for most of my substance abuse, and it always heightened at the end of a relationship. Hmm. And it certainly did that throughout my life. So obviously, I, I broke up with that woman, and so I just tumbled back hardcore into more and more substance abuse, basically. Yeah. Yeah. What, what does your life look like? How do you manage to have a relationship when that your life is so revolving around? You basically around use each other. You just it's a, it's a selfish existence. You, the people in your life are there because you can get something from them. Mm. And um, as much as you think you have tight, close friendships, at the end of the day, if they can't get something from you and you can't get something from them, they're not in your life, basically. Sure. But you do. You, you, we're, we're built for relationships, and so you want them. And you, you know, when you're in that sort of state of mind, you, you, you're in relationships with people that are doing the same thing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so at the same time, you're, you're spending kind of everything you've got, got on these addictions. It's thousands and thousands mm. of dollars. The only way mm. I could survive to eat was to steal. Um, I, yeah, I had all my money went to drugs um, and then I would steal to support my habit and, and to survive, basically. That's how, that's how bad it got. Wow. Yeah. So... So you're turning up at work. You, you've had a pretty big weekend. What, what does that look like? Uh, you, you learn how to juggle it and you learn how to take substances so you can function at work. Hmm. Yep. So the old balancing act. A yeah. Absolutely. You learn how to do that. Yeah. Sure. Yep. yep. And how do you feel having to do that? It's absolute chaos. It's hmm. excruciating having to go to work like that hmm. without having slept for days on end. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so moving forward in your life now... No, you're, a, you're a Christian. You, you've just been playing for us here in our worship band. Mm -hmm. How is it that a guy comes out of King's Cross and ends up sitting on a couch with a pastor up the front of church? Like, we're, we're, What are we doing here today? We're, what has God done to be able to bring you out of that situation? Look, I think for the, for the 14 years, God was trying to lead me out of that situation. And in baby steps, he did that. Um, if, first of all, he got me out of King's Cross and out of Sydney. Um, he, he certainly painted in my heart that I needed to get out of Sydney. Mm. Absolutely. That was the first step. And he did that by a miracle. He got me out of there. Yeah. Financially, he'll get me out of there. And then I went on a journey for, you know, in the next four or five years. Um, yeah, just, I, I was trying to stop the addiction, trying to get out of the addiction myself. I was trying to move from town to town because, you know, if you can get away from the friends that are doing it, might, you might have a chance of getting out of it. Sure. And so that's what I thought I could do. But everywhere I went. It's just, I was surrounded by it constantly. Yeah. It would always just come up. And, you know, I might go, I might be sober for a month or I might be sober for two months even, but then it would just start again. Mm. And it's just this, you know, just this perpetual addiction. I, sure. Yeah, it's just horrific. Yeah. So, so you ended up as a truck driver? Yeah, I ended up mm. becoming, a, becoming a truck driver um, for, for a company. And, yeah, so we'll take it to where of my conversion go Let's there. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. okay. So um, I was working out, out at a place called Walgett and um, yeah, I was just watching a video one night on, on YouTube, a, a prison video. I used to like watching prisoners probably because I was a prisoner myself really. I could sure. relate to these guys. Hmm. And um, yeah, they, I, they showed a, a clip of these guys walking through a large scanning machine like you would have at an airport and they were scanning their wrists because they had barcodes on their wrists. Now, growing up as a Pentecostal, 
um, the teaching on the mark of the beast is it's going to be a barcode, it's going to be a microchip. So I saw this and, you know, still having some belief in God, I, I was just like, wow, are we really at that time in, in life where Jesus is about to come back and I'm looking at my life going, wow, I am so not ready for this, I'm going hmm. to hell. Wow. And I knew that um, very much so. And over the course of the next couple of weeks, I just was just ploughing through YouTube trying to find out anything I could because I was starting to get really worried about hmm. my salvation. I always thought that I would come back to God and, and um, I would repent and it would be okay. M many times when I would wipe myself out, I'd be in bed and I used to feel like my heart was about to explode and I thought I was about to die. I would cry to God and ask for salvation. But, uh, you know, the next day I'd be, <laughs> I'd be back doing the same exact same thing. There was, hmm. no, there was no change of heart in that. I was crying out to God out of fear, not out of love. Wow. Um, yeah, but yeah, in that couple of weeks before my conversion, yeah, I was just ploughing through YouTube, listening to some wacky stuff about the mark of the beast. And uh, w one night, I was I was in the cab of the truck, and I opened one video up, and this this guy comes up on the stage, and he just the Holy Spirit started to work on my heart. That and when the Holy Spirit works on your heart, there's there's it's indescribable. There's nothing else like it. Mm. Like there's there's nothing worldly like it. You can't just describe what that feels like. You know when the Holy Spirit starts to talk to you. And over the space of about 45 minutes, God just completely transformed my life. Wow. Um, yeah, like I didn't know who the pastor was, what denomination he was from. But the, the biggest thing was this, this pastor was just quoting Bible verse after Bible verse after Bible verse. So it was the word of God that I was hearing for the first time. It wasn't just some guy's reading a Bible verse and giving an opinion for 45 minutes. He was just mm. letting the Bible interpret itself. Um, it was absolutely f phenomenal. And this was the first time I'd ever heard about the Sabbath. I never had no concept of the Sabbath. The Sabbath to me was a Sunday. It was you went to church in the morning, went riding motorbikes in the afternoon. I had no concept of the Sabbath. I never realised it was supposed to be on a Saturday or anything like this. But, but apart from that, the way he described it, it just, just blew me away that God has set apart this time for us to spend time with him. Mm. The creator of the heaven and the earth wants to spend a 24-hour period with me. That just, just blew my socks off. Like oh. I, it was absolutely, the, the love I felt was just phenomenal. And the Holy Spirit was just absolutely just working on my heart so hard through that video. And then midway through that video, God spoke to me and he said three times, wake up, wake up, wake up. And I thought my heart was going to explode. I sat up off the bed, man, and it felt like my whole life up until that point was a dream. Wow. It's like he just lifted a veil off my eyes. And, I, man, I just fell so in love with Jesus. I was just so, I, my whole life changed. The very next day, I, I got out of the truck and I was completely different. Hmm. I wasn't converted out of fear. I was converted completely out of love. Wow. And that's, that was the whole difference. Hmm. Yeah. So, so let's break that down for a moment. You experienced the love of God for, would you say, the first time in your life? I believe so. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Just overwhelmed by the sense that he loves you. But why is it that that would be so overwhelming for you? Certainly through, through the lifestyle I lived, there, what, there, is no, there was no love. Mm. It was void of love. I was, the thing was, I was being in that lifestyle, I was a habitual liar. No one, no one knew who I was. And towards the end of, you know, before becoming converted, I realised that I was completely alone. No one knew who I was because hmm. I wouldn't let anybody in. I would just lie to them. I would just lie to anything and everything. No, I didn't even know who I was. I wouldn't have a clue. Wow. I didn't know what I was. Hmm. So there you are. You're, you're experiencing the love of God and you're saying that it's love that converted you. It wasn't fear for the first time in yeah. your life. What, what difference has that made in your life? What does your life look like since then? My life is unrecognisable. I, I, the only time I think about my past life is when my wife and I were talking about it the other day. I, I don't, that, that person doesn't exist anymore. Wow. It's, it's not there. I, it's just complete, completely different. Yeah. Mm. So when, when the Bible says that the old has gone and the, and the new man has come, he's, you've yeah, experienced that? Born mm. again, absolute mm. conversion, yeah. Wow. But then I was, I was left with, the, after that night of conversion, I'm like, God, I have a drug problem. What, I, I can't stop this. I, mm. It's like, I, it's, it was my crutch in life. I couldn't survive without it. Mm. I couldn't remember how to survive without drugs. I didn't know. Sure. I, had, I, I just had to give it to God. I didn't understand how to stop. Mm. And what did that look like? What was the process of giving it to God? Yeah, so the next day I would go back to work and then 
that night I would come back and I was just so excited about reading the Bible, man. All I wanted to do was read the Bible. I was so insatiably hungry for the Bible. Mm. And so I would, I would continue to read it. And I thought, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take drugs tonight because this is what I normally do. And on the second night of doing that, I just got this horrible sense that I was about to lose this Jesus that I just found. And I mm. was so just gutted that I let this drug problem come in between me and him, this, this love that I was feeling and, and felt for Christ, I thought, I can't lose this. I can't, I can't do it. I said, God, if you forgive me, I'll just throw it away in the morning. I won't do it again. I'm just mm. not going to do it. And so the night passes and I, um, the next morning I'd scrabble the stuff. I throw it underneath the tire of the truck. I run over it. I get back out of the truck. I go back down. still not smashed. So I go back out and I hit it over it again and it was gone. And that's when I stopped using, yeah. Hmm. Yep. And the, the journey from there was phenomenal. Wow. Absolutely phenomenal. It's interesting just looking at some of the decisions we make. A lot of the times, it's not a fair playing field. We're, we're making decisions. For, for In your example, you're, you're deciding to get into drugs when you really don't know what the alternative is. Mm. Yeah, when, when you're a young guy seeing the pain that your mother goes through you don't know that there is something more that could actually take that pain away in a sustainable way no, mm. not something that, that has to enslave you exactly. or that is going to take, you, take everything that you've got yep. uh, maybe not in a good way anyway yep. um, and, and so, so when you finally realise that when, when you can weigh it up when the Holy Spirit gives you that insight that ability to see things as they are who wouldn't take that opportunity? Yeah, exactly. But the sad thing is in life that so many times we see things for what they are mm. and we still go back to that, that dirtiness, that filthiness, that darkness. And, and I'm, I'm praising God today, Matt, that you saw things for what they were and you chose to follow the light. That you said, hey, my life can be more than this. I don't deserve this. Every, all the decisions that I've made actually disqualify me from, from anyone loving me, let alone the God of the universe. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm going to go down that track and I'm going to allow him to transform my life. So just give us a snippet into what your life is like today. You're, you're in a committed relationship. You've got a beautiful young lady as your wife. What, what does it look like for you today? I, I have a lot of joy in my life. It's, it's amazing how happy, a happiness that I'd never felt before and fulfillment with my church family and my wife and the life that we have now. It's just mm. something I never thought I could have or ever would have. It's just a complete gift from God, really. Mm. Yeah. yeah it's, 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 it's been amazing. The, the journey God took me on after being converted was, was absolutely phenomenal. Like, mm. the way God... Like, my life obviously wasn't right. Yes, he got rid of the drugs, but there were a lot of other issues. And it was, it was so beautiful how I just felt like I was holding the hand of Jesus and he was walking me out of this horrible life. Mm. Like he would just point, point stuff out to me, like the way I spoke or the things I used to do. And it was amazing how the Holy Spirit put a stopper on the things that would come out of my mouth. And, mm. and I, I walk, the, the walk with Jesus was just phenomenal. He, he is so gentle and so loving mm. and so gentle how he walked me out of that lifestyle. It was, it was absolutely beautiful. And the other really big thing that he, um, he wanted me to give up was my work. And um, that, was a, that was one of the biggest things for me. I was, I was petrified of doing that. Wow. To, you know, I, I knew that I, I would have to break the Sabbath to keep this job. And, and um, yeah, so I knew I had to leave my work. And, hmm. and that, that, that was a really big thing for me. Yeah. Yeah, going on this journey with, with no self-reliance, no job, and yeah. just having to fully rely on God. And his, hmm. his leading was, was really scary. But yeah. uh, it it was just amazing how he led me, yeah. Yeah, how exciting is it to, to take that step of faith and, and to know that when God is in control of your life, that things that you used to think were, were giving you fulfillment or things that you held on to in your, your safety bubble, your, your safety line, letting go of that is actually the most freeing thing that you can do. It was very freeing and also take, being obedient to God, what he, what he did for me after that, was indescribable. Mm. Um, if God ever points something out to you that you need to stop doing, uh, please stop it because God mm. has something so special for you. It's, it's, it's not a game. He is, he's very real and he wants to know you intimately, but mm. if you have sin in your life, you can't do that. Yeah. It's yeah. not God not wanting to be with you. It's you have a blocker of sin and mm. 
And if God's telling you to cut something off, cut it out of your life. It's really not worth it. Mm. Um, yeah, look, and for me, my job was the last thing God had to cut off and then I, I did that. And, and what, he, what he did for me next was just phenomenal. Wow. Yeah, I don't know if you want me to share that or... Please. Yeah, so... We're here, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I, I wrestled with God the night before I quit my job. Like, because the devil would come in and be like, oh, but you can reach the people that you're working with. Mm. I probably could have, but I don't think I would have. I was too weak. I was a baby Christian. They would have just, just pulverised me. It just wouldn't have worked. So God, God knew best. He knew I had to get out of that, that job. Mm. And so I wrestled with God that night, and then I, I made that decision to leave. And look, the following morning, um, I left the book, um, The Great Controversy, at the, uh, at the um, reception for, for a friend of mine and just said, look, I'm not coming back to work. You need to read this book. Mm. And I jumped in my car and I left that morning. And as I was leaving town, um, I, I was just in intercession for my friends. I was praying for them, praying for their salvation. And as I was leaving town, man, the Holy Spirit filled me so much as I was driving. And the, the Spirit of God just filled the cab of my ute. And I just started just wailing. And, and, and the feeling of being filled with the Holy Spirit and... And being surrounded by the presence of God was phenomenal. Mm. God started to show me visions of... Of being like a little baby. Jesus nursing me and showing me that. He showed me visions of my grandmother, my sister, of friends of mine. And he showed me visions of people who I had to go and forgive. Mm. And, um, and this went on for a couple of hours. I was driving a car for about 140 k's and I didn't know how I was on the road. <laughs> I didn't understand it. I was in the spirit of God. He was showing me things, speaking to me in the most beautiful, loving way. And um, yeah, that was, I knew God that day. I knew him. Mm. It was so intimate. And at the end, coming to the end of that journey, I was, I was hanging onto the steering wheel going, God, how am I on the road? How's a car on the road? Mm. And he shows me a vision. I had an angel out this side of the car and there's an angel out this side of the car, holding the car on the road. Mm. It was just phenomenal. God is so good, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah well. if God is telling you to get stuff out of your life, just do it. Mm. Yeah, just, just do it. Cut it off today. Do it. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So, so, Matt, tell me, do you believe that there will be people in the kingdom of heaven as a result of your life? I don't know, man. I, probably. I, I, I just take a day at a time, you know. Mm. It, it's God's work. It's not mine. Mm. Um, I hope so. Yep. I, hope, I know God will use what I've been through. I pray that he does. But, you know, I just take a day at a time. I spend my time with Jesus and I pray yep. and I, I do my worship. and mm. Yeah. Now, I know a number of people that have known you and your, your journey over the last few years, and they've definitely seen the influence and the witness that you've had on others. Yeah, it's and, one of the most exciting yeah. things you can do is share your faith with people. Yeah. And it's just for not, it's, it's the pinnacle of life. Sharing your faith is just so awesome. Mm. Yeah. 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 How good is it just knowing that, that our drummer at church, the guy sitting there on the drums, the, we can praise God every week that we see you on the drums. Yeah, amen. I we we God can praise God, God every week that we can see you sitting here at church because there, there's an alternative and it's not beautiful. It's not, mm. and it's so easy to sleep to. Yeah. Yep. Mm. No, so, so praise God, Matt. Let, let's, um, yeah, let's just say a word of prayer. Um, as a church, let's just bow our heads and just pray that God's Spirit would continue to lead in Matt's life. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that you are better than us. Father, we thank you that you are God and that, that when we make you Lord of our lives, when we surrender our lives to you, that things get better, Father. And not just better, but they become the best that they could ever be. Father, we, we've heard today of how, how Matt has gone through life trying to do things in his own strength, trying to do things on his own and, and making a real mess of things, Father. Many of us can relate to that journey, maybe not with substance abuse, Father, but we can relate to trying to do things in our own strength and making an absolute mess. Father, we want to thank you that you're a God that isn't afraid to get your hands dirty, that you come down into the messiness of life and that you are able to free us from the things that are enslaving us. Father, we want to thank you for the way that you've done that in Matt's life. We want to thank you for the testimony that just even him showing up at church is, Father, of your goodness and of your love. 
Father, we pray that you would use him, continue to use him in a powerful way to be able to spread the good news of your goodness, Father, and your love and your substitutionary death upon the cross that you died in our place so that we could experience freedom and life. We thank you for this and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing today, Matt. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to invite Cam and Sav up here now and um, yeah, continue just delving into the way that God has been able to use broken individuals uh, and uh, bring light and life. Either, either or, guys, either or. So do you guys just want to, maybe we'll start with you, Cam. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hey, guys, I'm Cam. I'm 24, live in uh, Palm Beach, and a proud member of Kingscliff Church. You. As of how many weeks? Uh, weeks would be a bit hard, maybe like three months. Three months. Three or awesome. four months. Yeah, cool. Yeah, no, feeling awesome. the love here, guys. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Cool. So, so tell us, Kim, um, we'd love to get to know you a little bit. Tell us what life's been like. Um, let, let's start at the beginning. Yeah, right. let's go. Yep. Um, I was born into a Seventh-day Adventist family, probably very similar to a lot of people here. I uh, went to church Saturday, open Sabbath, Friday night, no TV, no radio, then closed Sabbath on Saturday night. Um, yeah, it was very, very normal parents, perfect examples of Christian parents. Mm. They always loved me, always put me first. Um, yeah, At, I don't know, somewhere in my teens, I sort of just wanted to make my own way. I don't know what it was, I was just, I don't know how it, how it came about, but I just, um, yeah, wanted to, wanted to do my own thing. I, if you asked me back then if I believed in God, I'd say, yeah, I believe in God. Like, but I um, just started believing the devil's lies, just mm. believing that, um, you know, following other things, like, Fame and money is going to bring me happiness. Building a reputation up for myself is going to give me self-worth. And instead of looking for that self-worth through Jesus. Hmm. So, yeah. so you're a young guy in high school, yep. and and you're starting to be drawn away, yep. um, just just by the allure of, hey, I could make a name for myself. I could do something big. Yeah. with my life. I could have a lot of money, have a lot of success. Yeah. And so where, what kind of decisions did that lead you to? Um, started, um, like Matt, recreational drug use. Started um, going out, hanging out with the wrong people. And like, like Matt said, it's just a slippery slope from there. As soon as you crack open that bottle cap, it's uh, hard to stop, and it's just, um, yeah, finding happiness in those times just escalated into more substance abuse, hanging out at worse places, to the point where um, I'm like 20 years old, don't need to work, because I find my own way of making money, um, I do my own things, and I feel important in myself. I, I feel that I'm doing big things. Yeah. So Do you're looking in the mirror and thinking, man, I've done something with yeah, my I'm, Yeah, I'm, I'm looking in the mirror and thinking, you know, I didn't do any good at school. I couldn't, I didn't get anywhere doing, you know, working a job. But here I am applying myself to something and I'm making good coin. Like I'm doing good, yeah. I'm doing well. Yeah. Yeah. Like I've worked out this and I'm getting a reward out of it. Sure. You're focusing, you're, yeah. you're, you're putting your mind. 
So, so what happened um, when you realized that what you were doing wasn't necessarily legal to make uh, all that coin? <laughs> it, it, there was a lot of things that came with that life. <clears throat> like, yeah, I had coin and I had nice things and stuff, but the amount of depression the amount of like real hard times, like I've, I've been like put in hospital twice. I've had my family's house uh, raided by police. I've, I've been, yeah, I've been hurt. Hmm. Like, How does it feel being on the run? Like knowing that, hey, if I make the wrong move or expose myself in this it's way, scary. Get caught. It's, it's scary knowing that I've been given this amount of something yeah. And that, like, I have a deadline. Yeah. And that if something happens to me, like, they're still going to want that back. Mm. I remember thinking that, I remember having a conversation with that, like, wow, well, I've got, like, a lot of money on, on my head right now. Like, sure. if I stuff up, like, like, if I go to jail or something, like, someone's going to have to pay that. Like, yeah. they'll probably come after my, mm. my so, family. So you're making decisions that are putting your family's life at risk. How do, how do you feel about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Like, my... My family's house has been, yeah, ridiculed. Of people have broken in, stolen, looking for me. Yeah. And my parents are like, what's going on? Like, mm. you know, just wanting to know. Like, I've I never admitted it to them. I was just like, oh. Yeah. I I, I play poker online. So I make money. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. That's not a plug for poker online. No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah awesome. Sav, let, let's pick up with you. Um, yeah, tell, tell us about yourself and, and just, yeah, your, your kind of childhood growing up. So, um, is this on? Yeah, yeah. sure it is. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I, I didn't grow up in a Christian family. I had quite a different upbringing to Cameron. Um, I came from quite a broken family. Um, it was just my mum and my sister and I, and um, yeah, my my mum was raised a Christian, um, but because of her experiences in the church growing up, and um, I guess she didn't really have any good um, experiences, so she wanted to give my sister and I the opportunity to decide um, what we believed in, um, I guess, um, when we came of age. Um, yeah, kind of um, growing up in my early teen years, um, I guess because my mum didn't have a relationship with God and there was still a lot of things that was um, weighing on her heart, she um, decided, um, not decided, she um, um, started getting a really bad substance um, abuse problem and yeah, it got to the point where I was about 15 and I just couldn't live at home anymore and my mum moved away from me, so um, yeah, as a pretty young teenager, I was kind of yeah roaming around trying to find a family and trying to find um, some kind of love and I guess because yeah, like both my parents left me when I was really young, I didn't have any sense of um, um, self-worth or yeah, I guess I just I wasn't really worthy of my parents. I wasn't really worthy of um, a family. So, yeah, I kind of just grew up having that kind of self-esteem. And, yeah, I, I guess that did a lot to, um, like, my confidence levels and just the way I carried myself. Um, as I kind of got a little bit older, I, I wanted to obviously make friends and find some kind of home. So I... Um, yeah, started um, making friends in really bad places and um, I obviously was looking for everyone, um, looking for what everyone was looking for, which, which is love. And I found myself in some really bad relationships where, um, yeah, like I was 19 and had to get um, orders against um, people. And so, yeah, it was, it was a really bad um, place for me and... Yeah, I guess I just didn't feel um, worth anything and I um, 
suffered from um, like really long depressive episodes where I'd kind of just isolate myself from the world and um, yeah, pretty much just lock myself in my room and just cry and just <laughs> yeah, not really have any, um, yeah, I just didn't feel like I was worth anything in the world. So, so, so you're there, you're believing the lies that the devil's telling you, how you're not worth anything, your life means nothing, and that's having a negative impact on the way that you relate to other people and just the way that you're wanting them to, to step into that space for you. How interesting is it, church, that we can recognize that there, there is nothing wrong with Savannah. <laughs> there is no reason why she should believe the lies that the devil is telling her. We, we can sit here and say, that, why would you? Like, you, you've got the whole world in front of you. You're a beautiful young lady. Like, you could do anything with your life. And yet, when we look at our own selves, we believe those same lies about ourselves, don't we? We look at ourselves and we think, man, I'm, I'm broken, God can't use me, I'm, I'm worth nothing, I need others to fill that space in my life. Mm. And, and just from you sharing that, it, it triggers thoughts in my own mind of, hey, I've believed that same thing. And that's led to, to negative circumstances in my life as well. And so I think it's really good to just stop for a moment and just say, hey, th- they are lies. The, the devil it doesn't have a space to, to say those things to us. And I'm so glad that you've been able to recognize that and, and move through that. Um, so, so tell us, Savannah, how, how did you get mixed up with this guy over here? <laughs> like, like, let's, let's go there. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, so, yeah, I guess because I was looking for love in the wrong places. <laughs> And, um, yeah, there was this cool guy who wow. had cool clothes and um, always had a haircut and stuff. That's and me. Yeah. I mean, it was a step I up. I was hoping from, it was your brother, right? But, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Terrible. It was yeah. a step up from, um, like, the last relationships I had were just crazy and emotionally twisted. So, um, Look at this guy. He's getting excited. He's putting his microphone up. He's <laughs> Yeah, so I guess um, Cameron and I just started <laughs> hanging out, and um, this was in sort of uh, probably the midst of, um, yeah, I mean, because of the bad relationships I had, and I, to me, Cameron was like, he was fine. Like, there was nothing wrong with him. I didn't even see, didn't see anything bad. I was just like, he's just, he's cool, you know? <laughs> it was a fun time, and... Yeah, I guess we started spending time together and I didn't know anything about Cameron's um, Christian background. I knew his mum because she was the guidance officer at my school when I was growing up, so I guess okay. I was a problem child, so I went and seen Donna. And um, yeah, I guess we started spending time with each other. And So, so Sav, you, mm-hmm. you started hanging out with Cam when you'd say he was at his peak almost yeah. uh, of... At the Six, the, uh, yeah, yeah <laughs> at the top of the bottom, if you will. <laughs> yeah. that, that's how you described it to me, Cam, and Sav. Like you, you guys said, hey, we got together when we were at the lowest of the low, yeah. like in that yeah. pit. I'd say I, that was the, my, my bottom as well. Yeah, it was at the point where I started spending more and more time with Savannah because I wanted to get away from what I was doing. I sort of saw... Spending time with, with Savannah is like my time away from that. I'd kind of hide at her house or come see her so she'd make me feel better. Like, yeah, some sad times, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 How, how did you feel dur- during those moments, Sav? Just you needed Cam just as much. He was um, filling that same void for you. Yeah, I think um, at that point I was pretty numb to everything. Didn't really have much feelings. Didn't really have anything. Mm. Really, I was just like a um, like a a walking shell. Wow. There was nothing really left of me at that point. I was just completely broken. Just, hmm. yeah, just had, yeah, no, no real direction, no, no worth, no real friendships or 
or anything. I was just, um, yeah, just like a shell, I guess. Mm. Mm. So how, how did God bring you to be sitting here today? Like, what, what does that look like for you? Cam, that meant that you had to, to pay some debts to society? Yes, that's one way of putting it. <laughs> I, um, in that time, it was right in that time, I yeah, found myself sitting in um, um, the watch house, like going to jail. And it was at that point where my heart changed. Well, wow. I was I was in there, in a in a schmock, knowing that I was going to do some time, and I realised, wow, like it was so obvious that my life was going to end up there. Mm. Like uh, it was so obvious. Like we used to joke about it, like yeah, we're definitely going to jail. Like, and now that I was there, I was like. Man, I could have done anything with my life. Like, I could have seriously done anything. Like, and now I'm in jail. Like, yeah. this sucks. Yeah. And it was at that point where that's when I reached out to God. I was alone in the watch house, and I was I was singing Jesus songs to go to sleep. Like, mm. like I was just yeah. I just was longing that peace, and I knew it, it was from that point. That was the change from then to now. It's like a crazy journey. Mm. And, uh, of, you know, it's not just been, <laughs> that was it. That, sure. <laughs> I was sweet from then. Like, I, yeah. I've stuffed up so many times from mm. then. But that was when I knew that, like, this, well, doesn't, this isn't what I want and there is more to life. Yeah. And, and it's that wanting that real relationship with God and the relationship that my parents showed me. My, you can imagine, you know, just seven-day Adventist parents and they're having their son go through that. They, they never stopped mm. loving me or, or being there for me and I just couldn't throw it back in their face. I had mm. to turn away from that life. And, and yeah, I remember coming out and, and s- or writing to you. Yeah, b- before we get there real quick, Cam, um, there, there's parents that are probably sitting here listening or, or watching this that are thinking, hey, my, my kid's making some pretty poor decisions. Like, what, what can I do? I feel powerless. I see them just making some absolute rubbish decisions with their life. Like, what, what can a parent do in those moments? What were your parents doing? Has anything that they did made a difference? Absolutely. Like, the way that they just said, you know, we love you no matter what. Like they would, they would tell me that. Like, mm. obviously they were so disappointed, but they were always just telling me, we love you, mm. we love you. And it just like, it was just too much to to not recognize that and act on that love. Mm. You know, they really yeah. showed me the father's love, and it's because of that. Mm that them just saying, you know, we love you, we stick by you, you're our son, and you're, you're always, you know, just doing everything, writing me well, heaps of letters and yeah. everything. So, so let's pick back up now. You, you're, you're sitting in that watch house. A few weeks earlier, you're looking in the mirror thinking, man, I'm pretty good, like I've done some things in my life. Now you're looking in the mirror, and you're like, do they still do orange clothes or anything? Or what? what's the it's, go It's there? green. Green, green in Australia. Yeah. Okay. I haven't been to visit anyone lately. <laughs> but, but yeah, so you're there in your green outfit um, thinking, hey, yeah, okay, this isn't exactly what I envisioned. But God still spoke to you in that moment. And in the meantime, you, you reached out to Sat because you were in a relationship when, when you went in. Yeah, no, we weren't. Re- we, we were seeing each other quite often. But then I um, sent Savannah a nice letter. Hey, okay. At Turned the, up the heat. Yeah, yeah. wooed her over. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I thought it was just like, you know, just saying like, I can't even remember what was in that letter. But I remember saying stuff like, you know, I could have done anything in my life. We could have done missionaries in Africa and stuff. And this is, this is the reality that I'm in now. 
it doesn't sound like a love letter. <laughs> Just being honest. But yeah, what, what was your response to that, Sav? Like your your boyfriend or or whatever he was at the time is now in jail. The outfits were cute at first, I'm sure, but like, what, what does that look like being a girl scene? Um, I think around this time, um, we hadn't really discussed um, faith or God or anything like that before. Mm. Uh, but I think at this time, um, God really started working in my heart. I remember there'd be times where like, I'd wake up um, in the morning and, and say things out loud, like, wow, I really feel like God's with me this morning, but like, I had no idea what that <laughs> meant, you know, like, or, oh, like, it was just, it was, yeah, it was crazy. Um, I think there was something that was, um, that God was developing in my heart, though, that, um, yeah, like, um, Cam- Cameron needs you right now, and, and, um, he needs support and, and he needs people to rally around him. Hmm. Um, I, I was still not really, um, yeah, I still didn't really feel so great in, with myself. Um, hmm. But I guess being there for someone else kind of, um, yeah, allowed God to, to work in my heart that way. Hmm. Um, That's so interesting, Sam, that, that you're, you don't even know who God is and yet you're being the hands and feet of Jesus in, in Cam's life. Even though he's the one that knows maybe about God, but yeah, needs to see that in you. So he's glorifying himself even in you when you don't know it. Yeah, That's awesome. It's pretty cool. Hmm. Um, when Cameron, because um, when, when he went to prison the first time, he got um, released on bail because it was only like a month that he was in there but before his sentencing. Um, but he, um, yeah, he. he he came to my house and, and I remember him just with like the most beautiful look in his eyes just said, um, you know, I, I know I'm saved. Hmm. I know I've made mistakes, but I know I'm saved. And I think to me, I just seen Cameron in this completely different light and it wow. was kind of like, wow, like I want what he's got. I yeah. want to feel the way he feels. I want salvation too. Hmm. Um, and then, yeah, I think from there that, you know, one thing led to another, and yeah. So, so Cam, you're you're inside. you you see your your sense, your need of God. You things haven't panned out the way you thought they would. Was God able to forgive you for the things that you'd done? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I knew that all I had to do was ask for forgiveness. Mm. Like, I knew that. I knew that if I put my effort into God that I was saved. Hmm. Like, it was just so clear to me. It's, yeah, it was just just everything that I'd ever learnt yeah. or just made sense to me then. Hmm. He was there. He was accessible. He was there. Yeah. I started, um, we used to, the chaplains would come around and give us little devotions books. So I'd be with Marcelli and say, Oh, do you want me to read the uh, devotions this morning, bro? Do you mind? Mm. Oh, okay. Like, I was, I was keen. <laughs> yeah. I was keen to share. It's awesome. Yeah. No, it's great. So, 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 okay, so, so Cam's out now, and you're seeing this difference in his life. What's it look like for you guys to actually find a relationship with God? What's your journey been like to discover that the same God that is in control of Cam's life now can be yours? Um, so um, Cameron and I started going to Hillsong um, when he first got, got out of prison. And um, I think it might, may have been the first or second um, service that we went to. We were just in worship and, um, yeah, God just, um, just showed himself to me completely. And, mm. yeah, I mean, you can't unsee that. You can't unsee his glory. You can't... Y- yeah, I just completely um, opened my heart to him and just let go of everything that had been weighing me down. Mm. And I could kind of hear God saying to me that, um, you know, just surrender your life to me. Just let it go. I'm here. Yeah. Um, and I think I always knew that it was Jesus all along. Mm. There was always something in my heart that recognized Jesus wow. um, as being the one and um, yeah, from from that point, I I can't even begin to describe um, 
yeah, how much God has transformed not only my heart, but um, yeah, the, the way I feel about myself. Um, that child, um, that song, I'm a child of God, is just mm. like, wow. Like to, for, for, for me, being like a bit of a um, reject, <laughs> it's just like, wow, God mm. loves me. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, yeah, for yeah. sure. Guys, it is so powerful to sit here and just hear some of your story today, how even through broken situations, messiness of life, that God has been able to reach out and bring you through that. And, and just through sharing over the last few months, I've really seen that God is doing something big in your life. I see the tears welling up in your eyes, Sav, when you talk about what He's doing and the way that He's revealing Himself to you. I see the way that you share with each other just... Um, just the joy that you've found in the Lord. And so we really want to praise God today as a congregation. Um, we, we praise God that this isn't a place for people that have it all together. This is a place for people to find Jesus. Amen, church? That this is what this church exists for. So that people who, from the brokenness of life, from the messiness of life, can come to a knowledge of their Savior and find what you have found and that is a saving relationship with God. And so let, let's just uh, have a word of prayer um, for, for Cam and Sav this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you love us, that you care about us. Even broken sinners like us, Father, you care about. And so we thank you for your grace, for your mercy, for the way that you have brought Cam and Sav out of their brokenness and given them a hope of a marvelous life, Father that you have given them a hope and a future and, and an experience with you in the here and now that is transforming them and everyone that comes into contact with them, Father. We thank you that you are able to glorify, that you are able to be glorified even in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing today, guys. <clears throat> <clears throat> I wanted to just close this series with 1 Peter chapter 5. Those who are young should treat those who are older with respect. And all of you should put on the apron of humility, ready to do whatever needs to be done. As the scriptures say, God can't do much with proud people, but he gives grace to the humble. Praise God for situations that humble us, amen. So stay humble in the sight of our mighty God and in his own good time, in his own good time, parents with children in prison, parents with children that are making decisions that you would prefer them not to make, in his good time, in his good time, he will lift you up. Leave all of your anxieties and worries with him because he cares for you. Praise God for that, that we can bring our anxieties to Him, that we can bring all of the things that are giving us trouble, that we can bring all of those things that are bringing us down, that we can place them at the feet of Jesus and find freedom from even anxiety. Stay alert and be careful because the devil is roaming around like a hungry lion seeking to destroy anyone he can. We have seen this morning what that destruction looks like in just a few of our members' lives. That destruction, knowing that if you were to have anything to do with your parents, that you'll probably end up stealing from them or you'll probably end up doing whatever you can just to feed your own addictions. That destruction of knowing that, hey, I can't even face looking at myself in the mirror because I feel so worthless. I feel so empty. I need other people to fill that space, but they can't fill it. And so I just keep getting broken and more broken and broken again. And I'm even hurting people in the process. The devil is truly roaring around or roaming around like a roaring lion, seeking to destroy. We have seen that. We have experienced that. But the Bible tells us to stand firm in the faith faith, and resist the devil knowing that believers everywhere are going through the same things you are. Friends, we are not alone in the struggle. We are not alone through trial. That each one of us has a story of how God is bringing us through trial and situations like that. Your suffering is only temporary, but the God of mercy who invited you to share in Christ's glory will mend your hurts 
and strengthen you, making you firm and steadfast. Steadfast. To him be power and glory, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we believe with confidence that you are doing that which you promised, bringing us through broken situations, mending us, Father, so that we can stand firm. Father, we don't want to stand in our own strength. We don't want to stand because we think we can stand. We want to be broken so that we can stand firm in you and the power and strength that you bring. Father, we thank you for the journey that you have taken us on through 1 Peter. We just want to ask that you would continue, Father, to heal us. Continue to use us as wounded healers, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen.